Welcome back. Next up is Dr. Christopher Kunz with CA failures and the future of, of web authentication. This talk will summarize the events which transpired last year and show which alternatives are currently in the making. Christopher? Yes, thank you. So welcome everybody um, to the CA bashing uh, session. I think it was introduced like that um, before lunch. Um, a couple words about me and my company, uh, the usual plug. Uh, my name is Christopher Kunz. I um, did some studies in security and distributed systems the last couple of years and had to do a lot with CAs and PKIs in, uh, in that regard. And I'm one of the authors of the German book PHP Sicherheit. I work for a small company that offers hosting and cloud services in a data center in Frankfurt and um, incidentally we also sell certificates but um, that doesn't make this talk less uh, of a bashing talk. So I'm going to talk about the current CA system that we use to uh, authenticate um, encrypted traffic in, on the web right now and how um, you, like every one of you, trusts the Chinese government to do that and um, why these CAs are currently more or less a f point of failure for the whole encrypted or the whole uh, confidential part of the web and that's pretty much the part where the money is earned. And um, of course I'm going to ask um, you and myself um, if we can still trust the CAs like they exist now. And we are going to see if there's alternatives to the CA system um, to make it less catastrophic if one of the CAs or multiple of them fail or um, break somehow. And uh, how we can end the reliance on uh, CA organizations and how we can combine different secure protocols to increase security as a whole um, for SSL. So a couple of basics first, um, I'm going to jump really fast through those because I think I'm not telling you anything new. Um, actually the term SSL certificate is a bit inaccurate because an SSL certificate doesn't exist. What we are usually um, talking about is actually a PKI um, certificate for uh, in X509 form and SSL or TLS is a network protocol. So um, these X509 certificates um, tie a key pair they, a public and a private key to some kind of identity. Usually when uh, we encounter it, um, this identity is a domain name or an email address, but can be um, different um, other types of uh, identity. Um, the certificate is basically a signed combination of um, the public key, identity information and some meta information like validity and revocation information and after signing of course because it's digitally signed it cannot be modified or tampered with or manipulated in any way. A couple of important facts about X509 certificates, they have a lifespan, that's typically one to two years. The lifespan is um, never longer than the lifespan of the certificate that issued a certificate, so basically as uh, soon as a CA certificate expires, all certificates below that one expire too. Um, CA certificates can have a much longer lifetime for that uh, reason, it's typically in, in the region between five or ten uh, years. Certificates can be revoked by the party that issued them. Um, for example, if the owner information becomes incorrect, the uh, owner doesn't exist anymore, the um, domain subject, uh, the certificate subject doesn't exist anymore, if the private key is lost, or um, if the CA is compromised, or actually for no reason at all. Um, there's been an evaluation of um, revocation reasons for certificates, and mostly the CAs don't provide any reason at all, they just revoke without without reasons. There's two methods to do that. First is the older one, that's um, the CRL, um, certifica Certificate Revocation List. That's basically a list of um, revoked certific uh, certificate hashes or IDs and they are checked periodically against. So each browser has a um, CRL cache and they uh, check against that list uh, periodically and um, pull newer ones if needed. And OCSP is actually um, the online um, Sorry, that's a typo. It's uh, supposed to be OCSP. Um, online Certificate Status Protocol, and that's supposed to be near real time. So each time an HTTPS connection is opened by a client, a browser, or something else, um, the um, certificate status can be checked online. Both of these have to be part of the certificate. They are maintained by the CA, and they have to be basically the URLs to the um, revocation lists have to be in each certificate issued. So this is responsibility of the CA. 
Um, the interesting thing about uh, CIA, uh, about uh, certificates is not the public-private key thing because that's something we use every day for SSH for everything else, but the identity verification. Um, the identity of the owner or the, the subject of the certificate has to be verified before it's signed because after signing, um, well, nothing can be changed anymore. And um, if there is no validation or um, not enough validation for uh, the subject, the signer is not trustworthy enough because they didn't do their jobs. And um, they, the one, the person that signs the certificate has to assert that the information is accurate at the time of signing. And the key owner or the, the, the one who wants the certificate is supposed to um, give necessary information, basically proof of incorporation or stuff like that. So the signer of a um, CA acts as a trusted third party, like a notary or a lawyer or um, a government institution, and that is basically what CAs are supposed to do. So um, CAs have one reason for living, and that's, that's assertion between a key pair and an identity. They have to make sure that um, someone who claims to have uh, an, some specific identity have the um, right key pair, and they are asserting that by signing a certificate. And the only reason a CA can exist, and the only asset that they basically have is the user's trust. If they, they are not trusted, they cannot exist. They don't have a business case, they will not have customers, and they will basically go out of business. So um, right now what we are seeing in this uh, business, in the um, business of asserting certificates, is that there are two different kinds of certificates being sold right now. The first ones are basically low-value certificates that um, are typically uh, validated by making a who is lookup and then emailing whoever is in the um, administrative context, contact section or by mailing some specific email address under the certificate domain. And these are normally called domain validated DV certificates. Um, if you have an adversary who is quite resourceful, who can sniff your email, um, they can pretty easily forge these uh, certificates if they want to. Um, they can probably not, or let's say hopefully not, forge um, high assertion certificates uh, that easily. They are um, usually validated by something like um, send in your company registration documents, please send us your Dun & Bradstreet number, um, please be on the phone, on your business phone, between these hours we're going to call you, or even in some cases um, live site uh, visits or pictures taken of a company or, or storefront. These extended validation certificates are relatively new they um, have been invented, uh, well, more or less to strengthen the trust relationship to, uh, for larger companies. And these are the ones that turn your browser bar green if you visit a site. I think they're pretty much standard for every bank. Um, they normally have EV certificates and many e-commerce sites have them too. Um, CAs don't do this for free, usually. Um, certificate issuing is still a very lucrative business. Um, the cost is between something around um, 10 euro for a very simple domain validated certificate and um, 800 euro for um, EV certificate. It can be much higher for wildcard certificates, but basically that's more or less the price span. I think the cheapest ones are usually GoDaddy certificates, but um, they do the job that they're supposed to do. They, they give you the little lock icon or uh, differently colored browser bar as well as a more expensive certificate. And um, because this is a yearly price, um, that's a nice recurring revenue for the CA. That's good for the books. And it's relatively little effort. It can be automated uh, to a degree. Sometimes it's more automated than it should be. Um, but, but it's not a, a task that requires much configuration or administration work on, by the CA's behalf. Um, there's quite a couple of CAs. We're going to see how many exactly there are um, right now. Um, the big ones are Thought or VeriSign, which used to do all kinds of things from uh, domains to ringtones, and the CA um, branch has been bought by Symantec in 2010. Uh, other players are Komodo, and of course governments, universities, and different corporations run their own CAs. So um, we all trust these CAs, but actually I don't think we trust the CAs per se, we trust um, our browser vendor. We trust Mozilla or um, Opera or um, Google to um, have a good, inf good idea 
which CAs to trust and which not to trust. Um, personally, I don't have, uh, I haven't read all the certificate practice statements where the CAs say, okay, we issue certificates for this and that person or this and that um, corporation. But I think the Mozilla guys have done that. And I think if there's, there's something wrong, they, sh they should um, be able to take the right action. So um, for the end user, for the person, for my mother, for example, or my, my father, um, basically if they, are, they do e-commerce or they send personal data over the net, I would tell them to look for the lock somewhere in the browser, in the status bar or in the, in the URL bar. And the display of that lock, that has to be reliable. If um, the lock is there, the connection has to be secure. That's basically the requirement and that's something the browser vendors have to do. Um, browsers uh, have different measures for uh, storing that CA information. Um, some have their own trust stores like Mozilla. Some use operating system trust stores um, like, for example, Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer and Safari. And um, there is a, some kind of lobby organization community for um, browser vendors who want to interact with CAs, and that's the CA Browser Forum. Um, members are, of course, a lot of commercially operating CAs and um, the big browser vendors. And as a representative for the Linux uh, community, there's KDE. Um, many Linux distributions now use the Mozilla Trust Store to um, store their CA certificates, so they have basically delegated the decision which CAs to trust to Mozilla. And to be included in a trust store, generally you will have to um, follow and meet specific rules and requirements um, to operate as a CA. These requirements are um, that you have been audited either by the web trust program for CAs or um, you're, you're in compliance of one or two, one of two um, different Etsy standards. And of course compliance is always, um, it's always necessary to be audited, so that's uh, mostly expensive, very time consuming, you have to have people dedicated to the um, auditing process and many companies um, probably don't see a business case for that. So if you don't want to issue a million certificates per year, it's probably not worth it to be audited by um, the web trust program. And the whole effort is more or less only to not see these warnings while opening a website. Incidentally, that's my own. Um, but th these warnings, I think you have noticed in the last five or four, uh, three years, have, been, have become much more um, obtrusive. They are much more annoying. It's not just one click and then uh, the warning is, is done with. But I think for Firefox, it's currently five or six clicks before you can override a certificate warning. And that's with a good reason, because this is the only thing that stands between um, a client, a user, and the man in the middle attack that might be um, performed by a hotel owner or a telecom or um, a government. If you are someone who wants to issue certificates, a corporation or um, some kind of other institution, and you don't want to be audited, um, <coughs> You might just say, okay, we don't want a web trust audit. Um, it's too expensive for us. We don't have uh, the manpower to, to do the audit. We are not really sure that we are actually a web trust compliant or can be compliant in the near future. And we don't want to give the auditor or the auditing companies um, recurring revenue. Still, there might be a case to, uh, where you need to issue valid and universally trusted certificates for your customer web servers. If you're a big hoster and you don't want to feed thought your, your money, that's basically the GoDaddy route. Um, or for internal machines that, don't, that are not reachable over the internet and that cannot get, receive um, a CA-issued certificate because it's not verifiable that they even exist, or only for spying on your employees if you are a company that restricts uh, internet usage within um, the work time. Solution for that would be to buy a sub-CA certificate. Sub-CA certificate is a special certificate that is signed by a CA, like any other web server certificate, but um, it can itself issue certificates. So you can use that certificate to um, issue more certificates. In the, if you in, envision a PKI as a tree, you're now not a leaf, but you're a node. You can have as many leaves as, as you want. And um, you can issue the valid certificates for every domain, for, for everybody. There is no technical limitation in place in the uh, PKI or X509 that um, prevents you from issuing a certificate for, say, 
Google.com or something. There's only contractual um, obligations between you and the CA who sold you that sub-CA certificate and that of course that might cause issues. Um, because there is a very very big community of CAs and sub-CAs um, actually, this is a map of them, or it's one-fourth of the map. There's currently about 650 different organizations that can issue certificates that your browser trusts, um, in, in case your browser is Firefox. The, the numbers are more or less the same for all three browsers. They differ by about 15% or something. Um, this is only one-fourth of the map, the lower left-fourth. and. Um, the data is a bit older, it's from uh, end of 2010, I think. We have, r at the moment, about 1,500 different CA certificates that are trusted by um, popular browsers. And um, not all of these are commercial uh, CAs or sub-CAs, some of them are governmental. I think my mouse pointer just moved. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this, it's really, really tiny, but um, the, the spider in the middle of this big net is um, DFN Fine. that's the German um, association of, um, it's basically the internet service provider for all German universities, and they have bought a sub-CA certificate by Deutsche Telekom, and they are issuing more sub-CA certificates to um, German universities. So basically, every German university that takes part in the DFN can have their own sub-CA certificate and issue certificates to students or to their own web servers or stuff like that. And since I think 2009, um, these are automatically trusted by browsers by way of the sub-CA relationship to Deutsche Telekom. Um, that means that there's, I think, 300 uh, sub-CAs in place just um, at DFN Fine, and they're all housed and operated in one central location in the data center for DFN Fine in Berlin. Um, this is a very interesting case because it has been consistently um, talked about in the browser community and it has been consistently challenged as being not technically valid or not secure, not secure enough and it has always been validated by the Mozilla people as being a valid solution. Um, the data for, this, for these maps and this information comes from the EFF, which uh, crawled the entire IPv6, uh, IPv4 space and made connections to port 443 and looked if there was a valid certificate uh, on the web server or, um, or not. They saved all the certificates and <coughs> did some mumbo jumbo with it and then they had a database of the whole SSL market. So basically they know about pretty much every SSL certificate that, um, that exists. And this database is free to download. I think it's 20 gigabytes. It's a MySQL dump. And you can build in interesting statistics with it and you can see how well wacky many of the um, uh, certificate authorities act. There are certificates for local host, there are certificates for IP addresses, um, there are certificates for um, things like mail, there's um, extended validation certificates with a key length of uh, 512 bits, which is also quite interesting, or with MD5 signatures. There's a lot of inter interesting things going on, and um, there was a very good talk on uh, 27C3 by the people f uh, of EFF who built that database, and they have, I think, two dozen examples of things that shouldn't be happening, but still were out in the wild. Um, that color map is actually a PDF you can download on the EFF website and I have um, put the links for all the um, further reading stuff in the end of the presentation. Um, so this map shows about 650 or 600 something organizations of which um, a lot of are uh, sub-CAs. But still there's a lot of real CAs who are directly integrated into the browser and if you want to look that up you can uh, see that in Firefox. <laughs> Uh, it's somewhere under the settings. It's one, two, three, four, five clicks. So it's not exactly easy for the normal consumer to check that list. And then on, the, on that um, big list that comes up, you can see um, the cryptography module um, tab and everything that says built-in object token is a certificate that was delivered uh, with Firefox by default. And I've counted 160 in my Firefox 11 trust store. And that means that there is 160 different CAs in operation. I think in 2001 it was maybe below 10. So that market and the, the market players grew a lot. 
important thing here is that every CA on that big map, every organization of these 650, every of these 1500 different certificate is treated equally by your browser. It's trusted as much or as little as every other CA um, in the trust store. And that means that, for example, directly by way of an integrated CA certificate, you trust the Chinese Network Information Center, which is the government-owned uh, network uh, ISP for, for China, or one of the, um, the um, administrators, for example, for the Great Firewall. You trust a company that I never heard of until a couple days ago that's called Demiotis. They are a French company who issues certificates in France. Well, you trust them, uh, the Hong Kong Post Office, and um, indirectly, because these companies bought uh, sub-CA certificates, you trust um, Ford Motors, you trust this guy, and you trust these guys. Um, to issue a certificate that is trustworthy, or to issue a certificate for Google.com, for example. The problem is that um, we cannot be sure that each of these have the right practices in, uh, in place, they, they are uh, secure enough, the, their uh, sub-CA operation is secure enough, and that opens the door for man-in-the-middle issues. So I think everybody knows about man-in-the-middle attacks. Basically, um, the more sub-CAs I have, the more um, uh, possibilities for this I have. I open an SSL connection to Bob, to Bob's website, and actually Mallory sits in front of that website because um, Mallory has taken over some part of Bob's network or Bob's upstream or something like that, and instead of talking to um, Bob securely, um, I'm talking to Mallory securely. The, the condition for this is that Mallory must be able to provide a certificate that looks like Bob's certificate. And because um, certificates cannot be forged or manip manipulated, they, you cannot reliably um, recreate a certificate if you're not a CA, unless you've broken RSA or you know about the relation between P and NP, um, you will have to uh, have a valid CA certificate that can issue trusted certificates. Um, if you want to do one of these man-in-the-middle attacks, you, can, you, ha you will have to fulfill both of these conditions. First, you'll have to control the network, which is actually not that hard. For example, a very good um, example for uh, a network that is under someone's control, who we don't know, is right here, the Wi-Fi. It's um, some kind of these hotel ISPs that um, basically do um, active man-in-the-middle attacks, because if you try to connect to Google or mail.google.com securely and you're not logged in, they do SSL stripping and they redirect you to the login page. That's one of the typical examples for um, SSL men in the middle. And um, of course, if you're in a hostile environment in China where um, the government controls the internet or you are on the Chaos Communication Congress or something like that, you can never be sure that um, the internet is actually not controlled by your adversary. And the second thing is, and that's the harder part, um, the opponent would have to control the encryption keys. Basically, they would, be a, would, be, would have to be um, a CA or control the CA. Um, for some governments, especially China is one of the prime cases, Iran, Syria, um, of course this slide is, is more valid than for others, but in general it's valid also for Germany or um, the US. Governments uh, tend to want to know what their citizens read and write to be able to evaluate it in case of criminal prosecution or something like that. And some of them also want to be able to listen in on encrypted communication. So that's either um, in an unlawful way because they want to oppress people, but um, in a democracy or in our government situation, that's called lawful interception. So if someone builds a criminal case against you, they want to read your email and they want to intercept all con con uh, connections from you to mail.google.com, and that's the case in Germany and the US as well as in China or Iran. Uh, on the other hand, um, a government has a, a cup, sometimes a couple more um, resources at hand um, than a normal adversary. Um, they might have control over the internet routes in the country. Um, for example, for Iran and Syria, uh, I think there is only state-sponsored ISPs. In um, China, there is a couple of different uh, telecom providers, but all of them have to go through the Great Firewall, which in turn is uh, controlled by the government. And uh, sometimes you have a government-controlled CA, for example, in China, again. Uh, but also in, in Spain, for example, there's government CAs. Um, 
We don't really ha have a direct government CA. I think we have a sub-CA that's uh, controlled by the German government, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, in all cases, every government has the ability to make ISPs and CAs under their jurisdiction cooperate. So basically the uh, US government can uh, go to VeriSign or go to any other US-based CA and, uh, tell, and tell them to issue a second certificate for www.google.com for whatever reason. They have to have a court order for that, but basically for, um, for a government adversary that's very easy to obtain. That's always the, the easy route for, for governments, the so-called lawful interception. So um, to issue to, or to start issuing um, certificates that look like a legitimate certificate for Google or any other um, secure website, you can either become a CA, pass the web trust and Etsy audits, and then reveal that you're actually not a good guy but um, some kind of attacker. That's of course the most resource intensive way. Um, you can compel CA to issue a certificate, so you can be a government and tell them, please issue another certificate for google.com. We have a court order. Um, you can just buy a sub-CA certificate from a trusted CA. That's probably the easiest way out because um, it's expensive, but it's n by far not as expensive as um, becoming a CA yourself. Or if you don't want to spend any money, you can just crack a CA and start issuing uh, like there is no tomorrow. And that's exactly what happened last year, especially last year. There were um, two big incidents in last year and two smaller thingies in uh, 2012. And um, all in all, there were far over 600 different certificates issued maliciously by um, two or three different attackers. And one CA that was affected deceased within weeks. First incident was Komodo Gate. Um, Komodo is a certificate issuer that had problems before with uh, issuing certificates that were not really for who they were supposed to be. And on March uh, 23rd last year, um, they announced that nine rogue certificates were issued by an attacker. And these were for two Google services, um, for um, Hotmail, Yahoo, and Skype login pages, and for the Mozilla add-on um, site, and for someone called Global Trustee. Nobody really knows what the what that specific certificate was supposed to to go to, but um, the others are pretty clear there for sniffing login information and for um, sniffing add-on information. Um, that actually only adds up to seven certificates if you've counted. That's because the Yahoo certificate, login yahoo.com, was issued three times probably typos or something like that. Um, the attack happened via um, the Komodo subsidiary in Italy, who was reselling or selling um, instant SSL certificates to the um, Italian community. And they, they, I think they only ran Windows servers for the actual signing process, and the attacker found some um, API calls that weren't uh, secured enough and was able to sign, they were able to sign their own CSRs. And uh, that was automatically without any manual intervention by someone. So he was able to do the whole signing process themselves. And they put an interesting note up on NoPaste or somewhere where they claimed to be from Iran and working on cracking RSA and nobody could stop the Iranians and stuff like that. And um, there was a lot of buzz about that. So um, there was a discussion about um, how Komodo should be removed from the browser trust stores and how the CA security as a whole was jeopardized and how Iran was going to cyber attack the world. Um, well, not, nothing of that happened. Komodo was not removed from the browser trust stores. Um, they were warned uh, to, to recheck their certification practices, and I think the Italian uh, branch was uh, closed. Um, there were no further rules for CAs. There were no um, new security or compliance audits. And as far as I know, there was not a lot of cyber war. Um, this was after Stuxnet. So the, the attacker who um, owned uh, Komodo uh, specifically talked about how this was retaliation for the Stuxnet attack. This was the smaller incident, and the bigger incident was later that year. That was um, DigiNotar, a Dutch CA who um, had a couple of career-changing events uh, in July. Um, in July uh, 2011, they noticed that something wasn't right with their machines and um, that someone had actually breached their security. And 
Also, someone obviously had uh, issued a couple of um, certificates that weren't supposed to be uh, issued at all. And um, these were quite quickly or relatively quickly um, revoked. And uh, a couple of them were overseen. That's actually a more or less verbatim quote from the press releases. And nobody was told, especially not the browser vendors or the general public. And the Dutch government, who has a big part in uh, that CA's operations, uh, wasn't notified at all. So nobody knew about this. And in August, some guys in Iran uh, started seeing certificate warnings for Google Mail. That happened because um, earlier that month, um, Google had rolled out a new Chrome version that um, included something called um, public key pinning. So basically, there was a list of what public key was expected for each Google service hard-coded in, um, in Chrome. And um, the, the guys from Iran started seeing warnings all of, uh, out, of a, out of the blue for uh, Google Webmail and decided to make the issue public. And it was quickly discovered that this was a large-scale man-in-the-middle attack launched only against people in Iran because nobody outside Iran was seeing these fake certificates. And um, it was traced back to Digi Notar because they were the CA who signed the uh, certificates. And yeah, well, um, after that, Digi Notar was uh, forced to admit that it was there was an intrusion, and um, they also made it clear that they thought the attack was from Iran again, and um, that there was uh, some kind of government uh, taking uh, government agency taking part in that. And um, just by coincidence, Iran doesn't have a government CA that's trusted by browsers, so hmm, this might have something to do with the intrusion. And this time, um, it wasn't just an inconvenience for people who started seeing certificate warnings, but that incident actually caused lives to be in danger, because especially in um, the climate of last year, um, dissidents were very closely monitored by the authorities, and the um, fake certificates were specifically targeted to um, sniff dissidents um, encrypted mail traffic to uh, to their other um, dissidents in the other Arabic countries. And it might have been that people have been arrested or even executed because the Iranian government was able to sniff in on SSL certificates. And that made a lot of bloggers from Iran um, quite furious and they demanded uh, that things would, um, would have to change. Um, after an analyzing um, we could see what happened with uh, uh, during that attack. There were certificates issued for all Google services as a wildcard certificate, which was revoked quickly. But there were specific domain certificates for um, Google services that um, DG Notar neglected to um, revoke. Um, there were a lot of extended validation certificates issued and. Um, certificates for the Tor project, which is of course actively used by dissidents worldwide to communicate securely, um, for WordPress, um, for their update site, for example, and for the Mozilla add-on site. And all in all, there was over uh, 530 certificates that um, piece by piece were found um, and were traced back to Gigi Notar. Um, because Gigi Notar weren't really cooperative, or they couldn't be, Kinda. Um, they had been hacked before it transpired, I think in t 2010, and they didn't notice or they didn't care or they didn't think it was really that bad. Um, they didn't have any logs for their certificate signing process, so they didn't actually know which certificates were signed or the, the hacker deleted all the logs and they, there was, was no secure uh, copy stored away somewhere. Either case, this is not uh, compliant to, um, to web trust. But it uh, made uh, Gigi Notar uh, say, well, we don't know which certificates were issued. Um, we can't help you with that. And also, um, we cannot really uh, revoke them because, um, well, many of our certificates don't have revocation information. So they not only did they neglect to um, uh, have a database of all issued certificates, but they also uh, didn't offer a possibility to, to uh, revoke them. And that kind of made the browser vendors a bit furious. And um, it made people uh, in the Dutch government uh, furious too, because DG Notar was a participant in the PKI overhide. That's um, a state-run PKI for things like um, health insurance, I think, and for ID documents. So it's basically the government of the Netherlands giving you a certificate. That PKI was also affected by the breach, and the Dutch government um, started taking over the whole operation at uh, DG Notar pretty soon. And the browser vendors reacted quickly too. They um, 
issued emergency updates through the board that removed the um, Digi Notaris CA certificates completely from the trust store. And uh, within three weeks, Digi Notar filed for bankruptcy. So they went out of business uh, three weeks after the incident. And their mother company, Vasco, who um, also manufacture, I think, um, something like RSA tokens, security tokens, and other security solutions, um, issued a press statement that said, well, um, our core business was not breached, and um, the DG Notary incident was contained, and they didn't have to, um, to fear any consequences. The other CAs in the trust stores were all asked to reorder their security and to provide um, information about uh, their operations in a very detailed questionnaire that was uh, authored by the Mozilla people. And these were especially affected because their add-on site was targeted twice in both of the um, last year's attacks. That's because um, having a valid certificate for addons.mozilla.org um, enables you to um, install add-ons that contain malicious code um, in a process that looks like they come from Mozilla directly. And it also enables you to block privacy add-ons by invalidating their signature. And so the Iranian government could install some kind of sniffing plugin in the browsers of uh, dissidents, and they could also block uh, things like Tor plugins and stuff like that. Um, there is not really, not really a way around that or something that Mozilla could have done better to avoid this, apart from using their own CA and hard coded in uh, Firefox, the CA certificate, but that only works in a, some kind of walled garden where everybody or every add-on developer has to go past you and um, has to have your, uh, their app um, greenlit by you, like Apple does, for example. Um, Mozilla decided to not do that. Um, the third incident was this year, uh, four or five weeks ago, and it shows how um, the whole sub-CA business, which is basically uh, a money-making business for the CAs, um, is very dangerous. Um, there was a company called, um, or there is still a company called Trustwave, who are in the uh, browser routes and who are uh, a CA, a uh, pretty big one. And their main business is selling sub-CA certificates to companies. And one of these companies, uh, one of these customers um, used the uh, sub-CA certificate to issue certificates for mail.google.com or uh, whatever, Facebook or some stuff like that, and they fed those certificates into their um, data leakage prevention system, which sits at the network border and looks for people emailing internal documents or um, uh, putting um, company secrets out, on, out in the open. And um, after that transpired by someone who, uh, I think it was an employee who took the, um, his work laptop home and started seeing weird things. Um, there was a lot of criticism and there was an initiative to remove uh, Trustboy from the Mozilla store. Actually, um, the, the guy who uh, did that initiative by filing a bug ticket at the Mozilla bug tracker is from Nuremberg. He works for Norris Networks. And, um, Trustwave reacted by uh, revoking that sub-CA certificate and telling everyone that nothing happened and um, that it's common practice for people to use the sub-CA certificates for uh, data leakage prevention and that they're not going to do it again. And the uh, uh, Mozilla and CA browser forum people, they issued a very, very stern warning to the CA community, but effectively nothing really happened. So um, if you're paranoid, you might think that the CA browser community is um, some kind of a cartel that um, basically tries to not hurt each, each other. For us, the users is, there is, we are between a rock and a hard place because we know some CAs are really incompetent. DigiNotar, for example, they did not show any sign of um, competency to uh, issue um, uh, certificates. Some are greedy, like Trustwave. I would say the whole sub-CA business is born out of greed and out of the need to uh, address a corporate market. And some might be outright malicious. For example, I wouldn't um, say that CN Nick has my trust. So the question is, why in the world are we trusting these guys? And we, are, we all are. I don't know any single person who has manually removed certificates from their browser trust store. That is because we don't have a better idea or there is no better solution out there. And um, we can't just stop 
communicating encrypted uh, over the web. That's just not possible. We cannot switch to only using self-signed certificates without any CA intervention because these um, are susceptible to uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. Basically, if I have a self-signed certificate for my domain, um, you can go ahead and issue a self-signed certificate for that domain too. There is nobody um, stopping you from that because there is no, no way of identifying which certificate is the correct one. They are both self-signed by someone and uh, pretty much worthless in terms of identity information. Um, and identity verification, especially for large-scale business, is a, a very um, important factor. They want to be uh, to have a green browser bar, and they want their customers to reliably uh, know that they are doing business with the Bank of America and not some guy from Romania. So um, either the CA system needs to be fixed by routing the uh, bad apples or, and uh, making everything a bit tighter, um, or there need to be uh, alternatives. And I think we have seen uh, as late as this year that the CA system is not going to fix itself or to be fixed magically, so there have to be alternatives. Google um, introduced some of these in uh, Chrome last year. One of them was uh, responsible for uh, finding the um, uh, Gigi Notar attack. And um, there's actually two different um, uh, add-ons to Chrome that um, facilitate or um, improve um, SSL security. The first one is um, HSTS, so that's HTTP Strict Transport Security, and that's ba basically a list of URLs that are supplied either by um, hard coding them in the browser or by questioning some external site for the list, or even um, by a site telling in an HTTP header. Um, these URLs are to be accessed only via HTTPS. Um, that disables SSL stripping attacks, so um, the hotel Wi-Fi would not be able to um, redirect everyone who is not logged in to, uh, from facebook.com to 1.1.1.1 uh, at the login page. Um, the as connection would just be aborted. That's only for SSL stripping attacks, which are very easy to detect even for uninformed users. They don't see the lock, they don't see the colored um, URL bar, so um, that's only a very small uh, improvement. The second improvement that's very tailor-made for Google is um, public key pinning. Um, basically, Google expects, or Chrome expects, a specific CA to issue the certificates for Google.com. This CA is more or less hard-coded in Chrome. And um, there is a list of, I think, below 20 sites, Facebook, bigger other um, community sites that uh, have subscribed to this public key pinning. The question is, uh, how well does this scale into, let's say, 200 million different URLs, or let's say, a billion different URLs? Um, both of these approaches are ba mainly uh, addressed at Google and Google customers. That's why they were f in Chrome first and they were uh, for Google sites first. And um, I personally, I doubt that they are universally um, usable because they just won't really scale into uh, millions of sites. We currently have uh, around 2 million SSL certificates issued and valid, and that is the number that everything would have to scale um, back to. Another approach is uh, called Dane. It's the DNS-based authentication of named entities, and that's basically a combination of two secure protocols to create more security for uh, web authentication. Um, there is an IETF working group um, on that, uh, and their idea is to tie uh, certificate public keys to um, DNS entries. So there would be a specific um, resource type. In this, I think the, the draft says CAA. And, um, in that resource, there would be um, a certificate public key or even a digital certificate for um, the domain example.com in this case. Um, because plain text DNS um, replies can very easily be spoofed, um, this is of course only um, usable with DNSSEC. So we would have to wait for um, DNSSEC to uh, be widely deployed before we can use Dane. Um, I'm, I don't really know when this will be the case. Um, we have DNSSEC in the root zone for Germany, but I don't think it's really widely deployed across the board for, uh, with all ISPs uh, worldwide. So um, with the Dane approach, we would have to rely on an external project, an external deployment um, to improve uh, security for um, SSL. A more viable approach is convergence. 
Uh, the thesis here is that the CA system as a whole is completely broken and it should not be fixed. It should just be cast away and something else should take its place. And uh, so this something else is self-signed self certificates. And wait, self-signed certificates are um, susceptible to men in the middle, aren't they? Um, yes, they are. That's why the convergence project checks them from different angles and um, validates them a different way than we uh, currently do. And the goal is to make men in the middle against self-signed certificates impossible. Currently, there's a Firefox plugin that can be downloaded and used for that project, and it works fairly well in specific circumstances. The principle is that um, while an SSL handshake, let me take the mouse pointer, while, while an SSL handshake is done to some site.com, um, the certificate is transmitted, that's normal, um, and also the certificate's fingerprint a hash is transmitted. And the client who has installed Convergence asks three other servers, they're called the notaries, to make, make SSL connections to uh, some site.com, and these make uh, these, these open HTTPS connections and check for the certificate hash. They send back that hash to the client and the client looks at the four hashes that he has and checks if they are the same. If they are not, then there's man in the middle somewhere. Um, because these notary servers are in, to be in different jurisdictions, one of them is in the US, one is in the EU, one of them might even be in China, um, they might see different uh, kinds of man-in-the-middle attacks. And um, if you ask all three, you can have a, a majority of um, two that maybe sees the same hash, and if that's the hash that was transmitted here, you know you are relatively safe. So basically, you start asking an external source what they see, if they see the same certificate that you do, and if they do, you can be fairly um, sure that there is no man-in-the-middle involved. Exactly. Um, there is a bootstrap problem there. Um, I'm going to talk about that um, later in a second. Um, but you're right. Um, notary servers, I think there's about 12 or 13 right now. Um, they uh, offer a self-signed certificate themselves, and there's your bootstrap problem. You have to, enable, in order to start using a notary server, you have to um, accept their self-signed certificate. So you have to have a way of um, verifying that certificate out of band somehow. Um, that's a problem that the convergence authors are aware of. Currently, they uh, use a CA signed certificate, ironically, to get around that uh, issue. But um, that's a, pretty much a bootstrap problem. Um, if, you are, if you have come past that bootstrap problem, for example, you got the certificate from someone trustworthy on a USB stick or something, you can rely on the notary server to be uh, or to answer what you think they should answer because every answer is digitally signed. Even if you're uh, in the T-Mobile Wi-Fi network uh, in a train, which is known to do SSL stripping, and, uh, or in China or somewhere else in a hostile environment. Um, the, the requests to the notaries um, to check for uh, specific certificates are um, encrypted, so someone who passively sniffs on your network cannot build a surf history for you, and you can randomly only select um, one or more out of n notaries if you choose to do so. So the notary servers themselves cannot build a history of uh, where you serve to. Uh, if you have the man in the middle not on my side, but on the side of the, the service problem on the server, on the ISP for example, all of those notaries will get the same certificate regardless where they come from. If, um, and it's always the wrong one. If, if there is a, yes, if there is a man in the middle sitting directly in front of the server, um, that you are trying to connect to. Um, that's an issue that convergence cannot, uh, convergence cannot uh, fix. That's right. Uh, convergence is um, uh, destined or it's uh, supposed to, um, to fix issues with local ISPs um, with uh, some kind of a man in the middle attack against the whole country's population, the issues that have, we have seen in Iran, but not um, issues that are very local to the target server. That's not, um, that, that's not fi easily fixable. Um, 
the notaries themselves, you can make them do different things. Um, right now they open an SSL connection and return the hash that they see to the client, but you can um, rewrite the notary servers to check for um, existence of a certificate in the SSL observatory or check some kind of history um, if the certificate has recently changed or um, check RIPE entries, DNS sec entries or stuff like that. So you're not limited to the very basic approach of checking and by doing an uh, HTTP connection. Someone could also build an extended validation notary server if they wanted to. Um, there's a couple other attacks apart from placing your uh, man in the middle attack directly in front of the server in question. Um, someone could just start um, denial of service on the notary servers. Okay, um, you mitigate that by having a lot of notary servers. Hmm. Um, you, a government could reroute or block all the requests. Um, well, that's, that's uh, another uh, denial of service issue, but uh, in that case, SSL handshakes just fail. Um, uh, uh, the victim would not be able, or the client would not be able to open SSL connections anymore, but they would notice that something's wrong. And um, the most interesting scenario would be running uh, notaries themselves that always return the um, result that the, government, that the client expects, but, in, but actually, um, do not, um, uh, are actually controlled by the government or by some, some kind of adversary. But because everybody would know about these, they would be in the no, um, convergence configuration or somewhere else, the community would probably single these out pretty quickly. There's a couple of issues with convergence, and um, the first, uh, the biggest one is uh, it makes SSL slower. So the Google people are very keen on making SSL and HTTP in general very, very uh, fast and much faster than it is now. Um, but uh, convergence right now makes the SSL handshake a bit slower because um, they have, the uh, client has to wait for additional answers from the notary servers before actually uh, performing the full handshake. Um, there is no support for um, X509 clients certificates right now, which is a showstopper for uh, some companies. And there is uh, some uh, border cases for open Wi-Fi's with captive portals. These are the login pages that we are seeing in the hotel. Um, they do SSL stripping attacks, and that's something that Convergence detects as a uh, man-in-the-middle attack, which it basically is. There's also no verifiable identity information, because we don't have any CA signed certificate. And um, some load balance sites used different certificates in, on different parts of their site. So it could be, I think it was Facebook, that used um, certificates issued by two different certificate authorities um, for different load balanced, locally load balanced parts um, of their website. So users in China would see, or no, China's not a good example, users in Texas would see a different certificate than users on the east coast of the US. And that triggers warnings in Convergence because Convergence sees different um, notary replies from the West and the East Coast. Right. Um, there is a cache, um, but for initial, um, for the initial first initial connection, there is always an overhead, and the cache expires um, regularly. So, um, the performance overhead is not for every uh, for every connection, but for every first connection, um, you have uh, you have an impact. Uh, this is how the SSL stripping attack looks um, in the hotel here. That's. Um, Mac OS uh, warning that says, well, 1.1.1.1 um, certificate is not really valid. Um, that's a typical SSL stripping attack that's also detected by convergence. Um, sorry. There is uh, a third project that I would like to talk about very briefly because it has a very unique um, idea. Um, it's Sovereign Keys, it's an EFF project, and um, it aims not to abort connections or disrupt connections, but route around certificate or a CA failure. Basically, it's something that kind of reminds me of Bitcoin. Um, the, the developers have a data structure that's append-only, and um, everybody who has a certificate can uh, get a so-called Sovereign Key. That's just another private key that you use to sign information. You sign information that you put into this 
append-only data structure, which is hosted um, redundantly by the EFF people, and um, you add information as uh, soon as you get a new certificate for your domain or uh, you change keys or your old certificate has expired or something like that. You sign this information with your sovereign key and um, upon seeing a certificate for some website, you can check the sovereign key database if uh, the certificate you are seeing is in that database. If it isn't, something is wrong. Um, if something is wrong, uh, you can, using sovereign keys, route around um, the problem. You can just stop using HTTPS and use the sovereign key hash or some kind of the um, key hash as a .onion address and then um, make a connection to the website via Tor instead of um, HTTPS. This is kind of unique because it actually combines, again, different protocols and uh, gives you a fail-safe route um, if you are a victim of a man-in-the-middle attack. Of course, if your local government starts blocking Tor or um, your ISP blocks Tor, um, you're pretty much out of luck. Um, you're also out of luck if you are a website or a domain owner and you lose your sovereign key because then your domain, the DN, the um, certificate subject, is forever lost. You can never renew or reissue a certificate. You cannot retrieve the sovereign key and you can also not purge your domain from the history and make it not affected by sovereign keys anymore. As soon as it's once into the, in the database, it's forever inside. So if you lose the key, you can basically throw away secure communication for uh, that domain. Um, attacks are quite difficult though because an attacker cannot issue a sovereign key protected certificate without having the sovereign key, of course, and uh, they cannot easily um, initiate um, a denial of service attack because if the sovereign key database is unavailable, um, the rerouting would just take place. Okay. There's further reading. That's just for the version uh, that's going to be on the OSDC website, so you don't have to jot that down right now. Further, further reading and a short summary, and I think we can start taking questions now. More questions. Yes? If the conversion system has another uh, major problem, if someone is able to uh, spoof an address in DNS, it can make it point to some other server, there is a self-signed certificate on that name. So I connect to this one, um, get hash, ask all my notaries, all of them also connect there and um, everything looks well. So um, yes. for, for forging DNS or spoofing DNS is um, a, a very big problem there because um, you won't notice that. Okay. The question was that uh, if, um, or the, the statement was that um, DNS spoofing is an issue for conversions. The, the answer to this is um, yes and no. Um, if you are able to um, overtake the DNS server that's authoritative for a domain, it's basically the same situation uh, like having a man in the middle attack directly in front of that uh, domain. Everybody is affected. But the domain owner would notice that very quickly and they would take back control of the um, DNS server for the domain. If you manage to locally spoof DNS, conversions uh, can see this because um, it, let's take this hotel Wi-Fi as an example. If there is a locally spoofed um, DNS reply for um, example.com that points to s some other site in China, um, the notary servers who sit in the US and the EU and in the Netherlands and wherever else, um, they wouldn't see the spoofed address. They would see the original address and see a different certificate. So that attack can be detected. Um, if someone is able to take over authoritative zones, you cannot protect against that by using Dane or any other other um, DNS-based approach, and you cannot protect against that by uh, using conversion. So as soon as someone has um, overtaken your DNS server, you're uh, out of luck as a website owner. So, so uh, in this case, um, waiting for DNS is yes. only exactly. So maybe um, uh, in this case, conversions is not needed anymore because um, I can put the uh, keys there as you pointed out before. Um, yes, but there still might be local attacks. Basically, China runs their own DNS servers and they can um, issue um, other signed um, replies. The problem is that for a mighty adversary like a government, um, there is uh, a lot of um, they, they have a lot of uh, resources. For the smaller things, I think convergence would not be necessary as soon as we have DNS sec in a widespread environment. 
Okay, more questions? Yes. Could we replace the trust that we expect people to put into institutions, processes, machinery, and whatever, um, with trust in people and specific organizations? I mean, the approach via the EFF is this one is not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently working on a concept to um, try and, and turn the rules of the game with DRM around a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, where I think it's about time that we stop thinking of and talking about the ownership rights of the music industry all the time, but we don't really care for our own data to be protected. And uh, based on the same thought, or that thought, uh, we can build something around um, the trust that we put into institutions or <coughs> addresses per se, uh, also on something like a network of trust and go back to the PKI infrastructures that are in place mm -hmm. and then try to make it a distributed approach rather than another um, centralized one that is again prone to failure, whether it's, yep. it's DNSSEC posts that are compromised or men in the middle on the other side of the, of the line. Can that be an approach? Um, yes. Um, I think that's also a, an approach that is used very widely, uh, read PGP. But that's a, the tip, very typical web of trust approach. Some people are more trusted than others, and if they sign your key, you're automatically more trusted too. In the CA world, there's uh, CA Cert, who do this community-driven approach too, but um, they only um, use it as basically as feedback or as input for their own CA, which then in turn uh, signs normal CA-style certificates. Um, the, the problem with these community-driven efforts, in my opinion, always is that um, you have to find a major consensus between all the affected parties who is trustworthy. And um, for, the, for the browser uh, industry right now, um, I would assume the Mozilla people are trustworthy. And I wouldn't assume that um, Apple is trustworthy. So um, I would only rely on Mozilla, and that's just, again, a single point of failure. Um, I think the issue is always how to find um, someone that everybody trusts, or that, um, or a group of people that are uh, more trusted than others. Um, a web of trust can work, but it would require um, a lot of people to uh, take part in it. I think that's what the main issue was uh, for all webs of trust that were in place, and that's also also maybe the issue um, for. Um, PGP and um, why PGP is not used for um, web traffic. We could use it if we wanted. We could just stop using SSL. But I think um, it's, it's basically the only approach that is worth looking at on the long term. Uh, replacing the institutions, the commercial institutions that are uh, issuing certificates for a living and for profit with um, people who have a genuine interest in security to issue these um, authenticity tokens. Okay. More questions? Well, then I think I'm, I'm done. Thank you. And if you have further questions, I'll be around whole day and tomorrow. Thanks.